Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Thoughtful Thursdays speaker series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Good evening, I am Carla Umlin. I am the Assistant Director of the Library. I wanna thank everyone for being here. And I wanna give special thanks to Noreen Keppel for presenting this program and for all the work she has put into it. Also, I'm thankful to Michaela Hall, Director of the Library and the rest of our staff for supporting and organizing this program. We are asking all our participants to keep cameras off and microphones muted unless you're asked to unmute. This will ensure that there is no sound interference during the presentation. If you have questions during the program, you can type them in the chat box, and then we'll get to your questions when we open up the Q&A session at the end of the program. And now to introduce our special guest, Noreen Keppel. Noreen has been gardening for many years, and she received her Master Gardener certification from the University of Rhode Island in 2012. She has helped to create many garden spaces and consults with homeowners on the best possible use of their space to create habitats for pollinators, sharing information about best gardening practices and creating healthy soil are topics that Noreen is passionate about. Noreen and the entire Keppel family are great friends of Stonington Free Library. Without Maureen, we would not have our very popular seed library. She solicits donations from seed companies and ensures that we have the very best quality seeds. She sets up the seed library and keeps it stocked. The seed library is now available for in-person browsing or curbside pickup, or if you prefer, we can even send seeds to you in the mail. Noreen has also run gardening programs for children during our summer reading program. She's hosted our SFL nightclub group for a tour and social gathering in her beautiful garden. She's held previous gardening programs for the library and much more. She will return in October for a program called Putting the Garden to Bed. So keep an eye out for that. And we can't thank you enough, Noreen, and I'll hand it over to you to get started. Thank you, Carla. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, hope that you're interested in pollinators like I am. And I'm so glad that you could join us tonight. And I wanna thank Michaela and Carla and Ivy for uh, their support and the whole Stonington Free Library for hosting this presentation tonight on pollinator power. So the program tonight is through the URI Master Gardener Program and their mission is to educate residents of Rhode Island and surrounding areas in environmentally sound gardening practices through the dissemination of factual research-based information. So if you are searching for gardening information on the internet, make sure in the search bar, bar that it says EDU because that will be from an extension service and you'll know that you're getting the correct information. URI likes to highlight uh, five focus areas, which are land stewardship, food systems and agriculture, water resources, energy efficiency, conservation and renewables, and healthy lifestyles. And currently um, we are in these focus areas for three years. And currently we're in our second year of food systems and agriculture. So the pollinators um, fit nicely into this focus area. 
So the presentation will be in two parts. The first part, we'll talk about pollination and we'll identify who the pollinators are in your gardens. And then in the second half, I will talk to you about how you can attract pollinators to your garden, um, what practices to use. And then as Carla said at the end, we'll, we will have time for questions. So I have a passion for pollinators. Um, we have somehow become disconnected to nature um, through our jobs, uh, a lot through the internet. Um, and so I urge you to one way to reconnect with nature is to establish a pollinator garden somewhere in your yard. So we all know about the birds and the bees, but how does that relate to pollination? I'm gonna get my laser pointer out. So pollination is a process that transfers pollen grains from the anther of the flower, that's where the pollen usually is, and it's the male part that goes into the stigma, the female part, part that receives the pollen. And then down here is where seeds, fruit, um, other flowers are produced from either the same flower or another flower. And this process helps the plant to reproduce. But the plant doesn't have feet. It can't walk on its own to like shake the pollen off. So it relies on vectors and vectors um, help move the pollen grains. And these vectors are wind, water, feathers and beaks on birds and fur and legs on pollinators. So one out of every three bites of food is directly linked to our pollination. And it's really the healthy food that we need to keep our bodies strong. So a world without pollinators would be a world without apples, blueberries, melons, strawberries, almonds, coffee, and even chocolate, which would be horrible. Um, even these beautiful berries. Um, our grocery stores would look very different without these colorful and healthy foods for us to have as choices to eat. So if you like pollinators, so if you like to eat, then you like pollinators and what they will do for us. So this is a picture of a lawn and lawns have very little ecological value for pollinators because they're just a monoculture. They're just green, they're just there. Um, they don't do a lot, but yet we pour a lot of money into our lawns through fertilizers and pesticides. And then these chemicals run off into our water systems causing very unhealthy ecosystems. So in his book, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy, who's the guru on attracting pollinators to your yard, he has said this, the sad news is that we are losing our pollinators because we have done a poor job of sharing our resources with them. With the paving of new roads, installing acres of lawn in new developments, and undeveloped land being overrun with non-native invasive plants, we have significantly reduced plant choices for pollinators. Plus the use of pesticides kills many pollinators because birds, bees, and other pollinators bring pollen sprayed with pesticide back to their young and the young die. So when you're out buying a plant, always make sure you ask whether this plant has been sprayed by a pesticide before you buy it. Otherwise you are unwittingly planting it in your garden and you may be causing pollinators to die. So we need plant diversity to achieve animal pollinator diversity. And this is where you, the gardener, comes in. You have to decide if you want your yard to have ecological value. Do you want a yard that benefits pollinators and their food? Do you want your yard to have an effect on the water we drink? Do you want your yard to store carbon from the air and have an effect on climate change? If you'd answered yes to all of these questions, then a pollinator garden is for you because a pollinator garden will achieve all of those things. Different plants sustain different animals and insects. 
And so we need to design our gardens to support biodiversity. So let's talk about who the pollinators are. So the first group of pollinators that you would ordinarily think of is the bees. So this plant um, is an astilbe plant. And you can see this, it's one plant, but it produces these plumes of flowers that are perfect for pollinators because each one of these spikes have tiny, tiny little flowers all over it. So it would take the bee quite a long time to gather the pollen just from this one plume, never mind all the rest. Um, this is an astilbe, as I said, and it blooms early in the spring. Um, and so as they eat the nectar and climb on flowers, pollen will stick to the fur of a bumblebee. The most well-known and hardest working of the pollinators are our honeybees. Now the honeybees have been used in agricultural pollination where they work from morning to night. They pollinate hundreds of acres of crops and they're often transported from crop to crop throughout the country in big tractor trailer trucks. They were introduced into our country from Europe in the 1600s. They will eat anything, but they are very tired and exhausted and they're not native. And they do not like to fly in temperatures below 60 degrees. But we have over 4,000 species of native ground and twig nesting bees that are essential for pollination as well. There are mason bees and mining bees and carter bees, green sweat bees, digger bees, just to name a few. Native bees can live in colonies, but most of them live a solitary life. Native bees will fly in cooler temperatures because they are fur clad. And you can see here all the little hairs on their legs and all through here on their back. And on their back legs, they like to put the pollen in these little uh, pollen baskets, um, which you might see on another slide. Sharon Lovejoy, author and gardener says, they are mini flying furnaces who abide by the US Postal Service motto, neither rain nor sleep nor gloom of night can prevent them from visiting flowers. They will forage through the cold and the darkness starting as early as February until November. Uh, this is a hibiscus plant and the pollen is all here. And so this bumblebee just went in and you can see, and then the after it's totally covered in pollen. And so you can see how many of those pollen grains are just gonna fall off and go into other flowers. We as home gardeners can do more to support their needs for nesting, water, nectar, and pollen plantings. Bumblebees need a diverse array of flowers, vegetables, and herbs. Now this bumblebee is in Dahlia and I'm a great Dahlia lover. Um, many of you might be too. But many dahlias are closed dahlias, which means that the center of the flower is not open to the bumblebee. It's closed because it's just covered by petal upon petal. So if you're gonna plant dahlias in your garden, you wanna go with the open-faced dahlias um, such as this one. Um, and without bumblebees, we wouldn't have all of these raspberries either um, that they do a great job of pollinating that. So native plants are the best choices like liatris and goldenrod, um, asters, coneflower, and all milkweed. So think of it when you go to visit another country and all you eat for that time is that country's food. When you get back home, you probably just want a juicy hamburger. Well, native bees want native choices. They will eat other things, but they really just kind of want those native choices. So these are, this is Coreopsis here, uh, Baptista, um, uh, Sweet Woodruff over here. Uh, my lawn is minimal, it's just to walk on. Um, I'd rather fill it with flowers. So um, they also feed on grasses and wildflowers. Gardeners can use bee nesting boxes to encourage nesting. 
but you wanna leave your garden full of chopped leaves and hollow flower stems because these will provide winter shelter for your native bees. So there's um, Black Eyed Susan, which uh, a lot of us have that. Um, wherever it seeds itself in my gardens, I just let it stay because I know that it's gonna be food um, for the pollinators. Sometimes we're a little too hasty to clean up our gardens, but leaving them a bit messy is actually a better garden practice. Native bees will nest under the leaves, the snags, the branches, the grasses, and in hollow stems. So you definitely want to have like a water source um, <clears throat> for the native bees. Uh, I have a little pond with a sprinkler. I also have a bird bath over here. But really, um, there is a plant that is called ladies mantle. Um, and the leaves are designed to catch the morning dew. And that's it perfectly has enough water for the bees and the butterflies to sip the water in the leaves of a lady's mantle. Um, <clears throat> here again is another picture, just so you can see the diversity, um, the plantings. Uh, I like to mix my vegetable plants in with my flowers. I find that when the bees come to pollinate my flowers, uh, they also pollinate my vegetable flowers and I get a better vegetable production. So the second group are the butterflies. Um, so to have butterflies in your garden, you must have larval plants on which butterflies will lay their eggs. Once the eggs hatch, they will become instars. And this instar will probably molt, molt four or five times before it gets to this stage. So once um, the instars will feed on the larval plant until they change into butterflies, and once they are butterflies, then you're gonna to need to have nectar plants in your garden for them to feed on. So each species of butterfly has a specific host plant that they prefer to lay their eggs on. So this is a black swallowtail butterfly and they prefer to lay its eggs on dill, fennel, that is dill that you're looking at, carrot tops and parsley, they're all in the same um, plant family. Spicebush butterfly likes spicebush, and the monarch butterfly likes to eat milkweed. And this is the Asclepia milkweed. This was down at Blue Moon Nursery in Wakefield, Rhode Island. And these guys were just munching away. And so you want to plant one for you and then plant one for the butterflies. Butterflies enjoy wet, muddy areas that provide moisture and minerals for them to stay healthy. And this can be achieved by putting a container with no hole in it, filled with soil and water, and just placed in the garden. And the butterflies will go and they will lap that up to get the minerals they need to stay healthy. So there's one of the monarch butterflies there. You want to position flowering plants in full sun and where they are protected from the wind. And also I like to put flat rocks um, near some of my flowers because the butterflies like to land on these rocks. It warms them up and they like to bask in the sun. So essentially you're making your garden a habitat for any of the pollinators. So like if you created a living room you wouldn't just put a couch in there and say it's a living room. You would add other things, tables, lamps, pictures. So you think of the same thing you're doing for the pollinators. You're creating this habitat for them for what their needs are, a water source, um, flat rocks to warm up on, maybe nesting boxes for the bees. Um, butterflies, so, oh, so I do have plant lists that will be here available at the library. Um, but some nectar plants for butterflies are Mexican sunflowers, cosmos, zinnias, daisies, lantana. Most pollinators want their plants close together, so they do not have to expend energy flying to far away plants. So if you were a pollinator and you were flying um, above your yard, they would want to see where the flowers are instead of just seeing all lawn. 
Um, that just makes them fly to the next feeding station. So plant your plants in clumps. And if you buy one plant of a kind, buy three. Butterflies like plants that serve as a landing platform for them. And that's what one of these, this is a um, very early, it's called leopard's bane, very early spring flower. Um, whoops, and so I guess we're gonna go to this movie now. So this butterfly is on a Montauk daisy, which is at the end of the season, um, August, September. And so that's another thing is that you want to be able to have flowers that will last the whole season long. Uh, butterflies actually land on a flower and they taste it with their feet. They walk all over with it. And then if they decide that they like it, they will um, then decide to sip it. So an interesting fact about monarchs is that by the time they get to our gardens, um, they're pretty hungry and they have three or four generations before they migrate back down to Mexico where they winter over. But each, um, in the beginning, each generation of monarchs, they're, they're one plant that they love to lay their eggs on. And it's the only plant is milkweed. So there's lots of different milkweed out there now. There's swamp milkweed and um, ice ballet and asclepia, which is the butterfly weed, which is this beautiful orangey flower. Um, they grow in clumps. Um, the common milkweed is the one that we, um, you can see in fields and that travels by rhizomes under the ground and may not be, unless you have a huge space to fill, may not be the best choice for a home garden, but definitely any of the other milkweeds. And that is the plant that the butterfly lays its egg on. And a butterfly will only lay one egg on one whole milkweed plant because it wants to ensure that its larvae will have enough to eat and, and have a safe future. So the interesting part about the monarchs, and sorry to get off on this a little bit, but I just find it so fascinating. After the third or fourth generation, and now we're coming into like September, end of August, September in your garden, the, the last generation takes on a, um, a different shape. It's a little bit bigger. And all it does is feed. It kind of goes into a reproductive diapause where its purpose is not to lay eggs. Its purpose is to eat as much as it can. And sometimes we as gardeners, we get all excited about gardening in the spring and we garden um, you know, full throttle for like April and May and June. And then when it starts getting hot in July, we tend to peter out and tend to quit. Um, and so you don't want to do that because those pollinators now are depending on us to have the plants out there that they need to fatten themselves up and to reproduce. And so this last butterfly, when it's a feeding and then when the days start to become, the daylight starts to become shorter, they know that it's their trip that they have to take. So there's two migrations, one in the west and they migrate down to Southern California. But then there's one um, in the east, anything east of the Rockies, they migrate to these, um, uh, the Oakmail, I think, trees in central Mexico. And so this um, monarch will fly the 3000 mile round trip, but he also needs a little bit of that fat to start the return journey in the spring where he'll find flowers you know, down in the South before they get up here to Connecticut. So I just think that's, that's just an interesting story. So you wanna make sure that you do have blooms that bloom right through the fall months because these, those are big feeding months for the monarchs. The other group that you might not think about that are pollinators are moths. Now these creatures fly at night and they're attracted to flowers with a strong scent especially white flowers like this moonflower. Here's the moonflower, this is on a vine. Um, and this is a, a white phlox. Um, there's also four o'clocks and a white nicotina it is a, it's called the tobacco plant. And so while we are sleeping, pollination is still going on. 
because many moths have very feathery antennae and fuzzy abdomen, so the pollen sticks to them very easily. Now, the largest group of pollinators, believe it or not, are beetles. There are 30,000 types of beetles in North America. And they're, maybe they're not as efficient as pollinators because they're smooth coated, but they walk all over the flowers. And I don't know if you can see this here, but right along in here, the pollen is all stuck up here in the crook of this beetle's leg because the, the, the legs of the beetles have these fine little hairs, and the pollen gets stuck to them. Now birds, especially hummingbirds, um, they're the primary birds that play a role in pollination. They have these long beaks and the grains and they stick, stick to their feathers. Um, and as they're flying so fast from flower to flower, they're spreading pollen as they go. Uh, this is a pair of goldfinch. Um, you might not be able to see the female so well, she's right here um, and there's the male. And they're actually trying to get to the sunflower seeds that are there, but the pollen is all here. Um, and right now, some seed companies are making pollen-less sunflowers because you know, consumers like to cut sunflowers and bring them into their house, but then they don't want this pollen falling all over their table. So if you're planting sunflowers for your pollinator garden, you really want to make sure that they have pollen for the pollinators and not be pollenless because that would just be very confusing for the pollinators. And then we have the flies. Now flies are generalist pollinators and they'll visit many flowers and they're attracted to very small flowers that bloom under shade and in wet habitats. They especially like skunk cabbage, which is just starting to come up now and Queen Anne's lace. And hoverflies, sometimes called surfered or flower flies, they are solitary creatures. And there's one right in there in the middle of the rows. Um, but they, they can be great pollinators also. Uh, not so much bats, not so much in the Northeast because we have very short nosed bats, but down in the Southwest, the bats have a longer nose and a longer tongue. And so they're great for pollinating agave and, and cactus. They can get right into them. And spiders can also be pollinators, especially if they have a fuzzy furry body. They do enjoy a good climb over this uh, flower, which is a great pollinator. It's called clary sage. And it has all of these different panicles right here. And um, those, are, those are great for, uh, for bees and butterflies. And that's a, this plant is a biennial. So it will set a rosette the first year. And then the second year, it will grow three, three to four feet into this beautiful sage plant. And then we have Francis the frog and he's always keeping an eye out for stray pollinators, but that's the cycle of life. I don't think he gets too many. So now the second half, we're gonna talk about creating your pollinator garden. So again, here's another dahlia and it's more open. This, so the bumblebee can get in there. Um, if, it's, if they're closed, like I said, they're not the best for pollinating. Uh, this is a zinnia, again, really good for pollination and a, a good um, plant to plant. So one of the things that I, well, before we start about um, creating a pollinator garden, I just wanna take a minute just to talk about soil for a minute. Um, healthy soil equals healthy plants. And so if you um, haven't had your soil tested in a while, I would recommend that you do so. And you can download information from the University of Connecticut. They have their lab and for $12, you can do a soil sample. They'll give you all the instructions on how to do it. Um, be it for vegetables, fruit, or flowers. And they will give you a very detailed analysis of what is in your soil. Because if you're gonna to go to all of this work and you haven't had your soil tested, you may not get anything that grows. I get a lot of questions all the time. You know, why didn't this grow? Why didn't that grow? Well, 
you, you really should be every three years you have your soil tested. And then the great thing about Yukon is they'll also tell you exactly what you need to amend your soil. So what you need to put in um, to get it to become healthy. So this is a pollinator garden in my yard. Um, uh, and this is all from seed. And we're gonna go into that in a minute. So here's some of the seeds that are in here. These beautiful bread seed poppies, uh, California poppies, uh, Larkspur over here, bachelor buttons. Um, and you can see these beautiful seed heads right here. These seed heads will burst open and the seed will lay down for the following year. And the California poppy, very long slender seed heads and they dry out and split open. And so once you plant these, then you'll have them. And so if we just make small changes, we can make a, a really big difference. So to plant a pollinator strip, um, what I do is I get a lot of different seed from seed companies or come down here to the seed library and pick out zinnias and cosmos and uh, California poppies and larkspur and whatever else, sweet alyssum. And I rip open all the packets and I mix all the seed in a bowl. And then I find a, a sunny spot free of weeds and existing growth, so it's cleared. And I lightly rake the soil to loosen it up. And then like Miss Rumpheus, I go out and I just scatter the seed on top of the soil. And I don't bury it in the soil, then I just lightly rake it over again. And you do that so the birds don't come and eat up all the seed. And then you just keep that area very evenly moist. Um, in, the, in the early spring, we usually get lots of rain but you might have to water it with a garden hose. And then um, the seedlings will start coming up, but you wanna keep the seedlings moist um, until they're about six to eight inches tall. Then you can start to reduce your watering and you just leave this all, all summer long. Um, you will not be disappointed. It will attract so many pollinators. And that's if you don't wanna put a lot of money into like buying plantings and you just wanna use seed. Uh, that's a great way to go. And um, then you leave it um, dried, let all the seed heads dry over the winter. The beneficial bugs will, will nest in there. Um, and then you're good to go for the following year. You can just kind of gently clean it out and, and start over again. So all different types of seeds for um, a seed garden, bachelor buttons, zinnias, um, asters, beard tongue, um, it's just a great way to go. And you can see here um, the bees that come, these bread seed poppies. You can just see that they're just, they're just all over that. So let's say your space is small and you don't really have a, have a large garden area. You can easily use containers. Um, containers can be filled with uh, pollinating flowers like this one. This is a strawberry jar. So you have purple lobelia, white bacopa, uh, there's red calabrocoa, and there's purple terenia. So the bumblebees would love this and this. Humming, whoops, sorry. Hummingbirds would love this. The little hover. The little hoverflies would love uh, all of these and the bumbles would love these. So you certainly can do a pollinator garden just with containers. So you wanna make your garden a haven for pollinators. You wanna provide food with blooming plants throughout the season, starting early in April through November. Leave the violets and the dandelions. I know sometimes you don't like to see them in your lawn, but they are, one of the first um, pollinator rich uh, flowers to have, especially for those early spring um, pollinators that are just emerging from their nest over the winter. Um, these are pollinator plants for pollinators as they warm up and many pollinator plants will reseed themselves, giving you plants for next season. So you wanna think like a pollinator. You wanna be bountiful, be showy, be diverse. Be patient, be gentle, go native when you can, be sunny, be aware, be a little bit messy, be homey, 
be friendly, be chemical free. And I'm going to add one more, be the change. Um, because each garden really does count for pollinators. And we're going to go through each one of these um, as we go along. So yeah, there's my, my dog Ozzy there um, looking at me gardening. So be bountiful. Plant big patches of each plant species for foraging efficiency. So this is a perennial chrysanthemum. It's called hillside pink. And it started out as a little four and a half inch uh, potted plant. And the thing just grew and grew and grew. And you can see, um, I, I dug up some and I added it here. And I was out there, this is a great um, plant for the fall, for September and October. The monarchs love it. And I must have counted 25 different kinds of bees um, on this. So this is a great um, later in the season plant. So you wanna be showy, have flowers blooming throughout the growing season. So this is that leopard's bane that we looked at. And then here you have lavender. Um, I think this is like a little simple rose, uh, coreopsis here. Um, and, and be diverse, plant as many species for abundant pollen and nectar and specific plants to host butterflies. Because the more diverse your plants, the more diverse is your habitat. Um, and you can see this is, you know, the bunnies are up here. Um, I don't care about my lawn, so I do have bunnies, um, but my lawn has a lot of clover in it. So the bunnies eat the clover and they don't ever touch my raised beds where I'm growing all my vegetables. I still can't believe it, but they just seem to be really happy with the clover because that's their native plant and that's what they like to eat. And you can see here, a very diverse um, array of planting. So be patient. It takes time for plants to grow and for pollinators to find them. Be gentle. Oh, most bees will avoid stinging. It's a self-defense behavior and the males do not, not sting. So you wanna plant your nectar and your pollinator plants in full sun and go native where you can. So native plant choices, again, are the best. Um, they're coming out with more and more beautiful native plants. And so uh, a good place to go for native plants is Blue Moon Nursery, as I said, in Wakefield, Rhode Island. And you wanna be aware, sit in your garden and observe how many different bees and butterflies and beetles are there and take photos. Uh, be a little messy. So this is an area in my yard that I really don't touch. I just let it stay. Um, there are some weeds in there right now. Um, it does have uh, monarda in there for the bumblebees in the back. Um, and it does have uh, poppies early in the spring. And then on this side, this is a little bee nesting. And you can see this little uh, bee plug this hole with these little grasses. It was a little um, bee carrying wasp that was a great pollinator, a very gentle pollinator. Um, and so this is a great thing. And be homey, uh, use bee boxes or pile of twigs, but create pollinator gardens to educate others when they visit your yard. So this is along my driveway. And this again is all from seed, uh, not this big thing. I actually took that out. This is all from seed, coreopsis, uh, blanket flower, um, lots of bread seed poppies, uh, daisies, uh, lup lupin, which is down here. Um, and just make sure that you only use organic methods. This insecticidal soap is an organic method. Um, I don't really use any pesticides or herbicides in my yard. Um, I just don't like what it does. Plus I have, I have dogs, so I want to keep them healthy. So just a little bit about the Stonington Pollinator Pathways Project. Um, a pollinator pathway is a pesticide-free corridor of native and pollinator plants that provide nutrition and habitat for pollinators. These corridors are connected by public and private land, and even window boxes and container plantings can be part of the pathway. So Stonington became part of this pathway last year. Uh, the pathway uh, 
called the Northeast uh, Pollinator Pathway was first formed in 2017 in Wilton, Connecticut by a woman named Louise Washer. And it connected land in the Hudson Valley, New York area with land in Connecticut, both public and private. And now over 27 towns and with more being added have joined um, in the pollinator pathway. And our land sometimes can be very fragmented. And so the, the pathway is to connect land more easily for those pollinators to be able to look down and see where the food stations are, where they can land and where they can um, do their pollination. So the town of Stonington established three pollinator gardens on town property, and they're offering pollinator information and plant lists at town hall. Any resident that wants to have their yard be part of the pollinator project is asked to register their property at town hall where signs are available to, dis to display. Each resident is asked to take the pollinator pledge, which asks to include native plants, and it can only be one native plant, and manage invasive species on your property, to be pesticide and herbicide free, to rethink your lawn by mowing less and mowing higher, add pollinator friendly plantings, and help spread the word by displaying a sign. And everything in nature is connected to everything in nature is connected to everything in nature. And we are a vital part of that connection. So our effort will affect future generations. So the time is now. URI Master Gardener Program has this saying, when you learn something new, you do something new. And I hope that this information has helped you in planning pollinator friendly gardens. And you want to remember that a garden is only as rich and beautiful as the integral health of the system. Pollinators are essential to the system and you want to make your home their home. I do have handouts here at the library. And as Carla said, um, come down and visit the seed library. Um, I add new seeds in once a week. Uh, there are flowers and vegetables. Seeds were kind of hard to come by this year. Um, here's some more resources for you to look into. Um, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. He also, his new book is Nature's Best Hope. And I know that the library has both of these. Attracting Beneficial Bugs to Your Garden by Jessica Walliser is a great resource. And then three organizations, uh, ecobeneficial.com, the Pollinator Partnership, and Xerces Society. They all have plant lists. They all have great information on how to start a pollinator garden. And then the Connecticut Wild Ones and the Rhode Island Wild Plant Society, they are great places for you to go for native plant choices. And they do have sales um, in the spring where you can get um, native plants. And if you have any questions at all, uh, jot down my uh, email. Um, please feel free to email me. Um, I answer questions all the time on, on gardening. And I know the Pollinator Pathway puts out a newsletter called The Buzz. And if you Google that, um, you can sign up to receive that newsletter. And that has great information, up-to-date information. And the last slide I'll leave you with is um, URI has a hotline here um, and also an email, and they, uh, they will answer any of your gardening questions, pollinator, vegetable, soil, uh, pest management. Um, it's a great resource to have. Uh, people are there uh, five days a week, and then again with the, the email, they will answer your questions. So I guess we'll take questions now, Carla. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Noreen. That was inspiring, to say the least. I will look at some of our questions here in the chat. So the first one we have says, thank you, Noreen. What is the best way to use the compost that we have been collecting over the last several seasons? Well, the best way is to just add it right into your soil. So if you're you know, creating a garden, um, you definitely want to use compost. And if you're creating a pollinator garden, that, that's a great place for it to go. But um, compost also is really, really good for vegetable gardening. 
So use that right up. And you can also save some of your compost to put into your container planting. I actually, when I put my soil together, I have a big bin and I just add it all in and mix it like a big recipe. And then I have it to just take from it as I need it um, during, during my planting season. And you covered this somewhat, but one question is, are there good nurseries in the area to get pesticide free plants? Yeah, um, I know a Blue Moon Nursery in Wakefield is good. Um, I think a lot of that now depends on us as the consumer. Um, I would definitely stay away from the big lot stores. And I know that's hard because they tend to have the best prices but a lot of their plants are grown down south um, in these huge greenhouses that definitely use pesticides. Um, you know, just because they're in the Southern area, they probably have bugs earlier than we do. Um, and, and the biggest thing is to ask the nursery, the, the more that we all ask at the nursery that you want pesticide free plants, the nursery's there to serve us. Um, then the easier it will be for them to supply it to us. So um, you definitely want to ask before you buy. Excellent. And we have a lot of uh, thanks. Thanks, that was wonderful. Thanks for tips on attracting little critters. Wonderful presentation. So if anyone would like to unmute themselves, um, we can have questions out loud. You can also kind of wave your hand if you uh, want to speak up and we can unmute you. Here's another question. Um, mowing high and mowing less, what about ticks? Well, you know, ticks are a problem here in, in, in New England. Um, you know, I just know that mowing higher helps, helps your lawn. Um, and it maybe get some chickens. <laughs> I know chickens like to eat the eat the ticks. Um, I know guinea hens love to eat ticks. Um, yeah, so that that's a personal preference. I mean, if you're out in a really wooded area and ticks are a problem, you know, then you're going to have to decide for yourself what's the best thing to do. Let's see, are there good pollinator plants that can also be good privacy borders or grow into tall, large bushes? Um, yeah, I'm sure that there are some, uh, some different shrubs that you could get. Um, I know in Doug Tallamy's book, um, there are, um, he has a whole list of like uh, flowering shrubs, but uh, summer sweet is one, um, the red twig dogwood, um, that's another, um, I'm trying to think of what else. I don't have a lot of shrubs in, in my, my own, um, yard because it's small. Um, but any nursery that you go to and you ask them, you want a, a pollinating kind of privacy shrub. Um, my yard is actually boarded with, uh, arborvitae, which, you know, they're not the best thing, but then they do give shelter to a lot of birds and they bring a lot of bird life into my yard. So, so I keep them. I'm right on a very busy corner. And how about attracting bats to our bat house? Are there any plants you can recommend? Yeah, I'm not that familiar with bats. Um, you know, bats mostly, I think, eat insects. And so you know, there's a particular height that you have to have your bat house at. Um, you know, they're not the greatest pollinators here in the Northeast, um, but they do keep this mosquito po uh, population down. So um, yeah, I, I just, I, I think there's a, a whole, in which if you have a bat house, you probably know that, you know, you have to have it at a certain height and in a certain like direction. Um, so if it's there long enough, I'm sure they'll find it. A few more questions before we wrap up. What are your favorite go-to soil amendments? I use azomite and seaweed. Other ideas beyond compost? I use um, chopped leaves. I, I love chopped leaves. So at the end of the season, when the leaves fall, 
I have my husband uh, mow them up into the lawnmower bag and I um, add them on top of my soil and then I just lightly rake them. I wet them down and I lightly rake them in. Um, pine needles too are, are good. I mean, they're a little acidic, but um, they're also a good uh, amendment. And um, I used to garden in a garden and the woman, all she ever used was chopped leaves and she had the best, the best soil ever. Um, and you know your soil is healthy when you dig down into it and you see a lot of worms. So worm castings um, are the best for the soil. And I think there is a business, I've seen him at the farmer's market in Stonington. Um, he sells bags of, of worm castings. He's out of Westerly. I don't know the name, but um, you could probably find it if you Googled uh, worm castings in Westerly, Rhode Island, the business name would come up. So either worm castings or um, you know your compost that you have or chopped leaves. Great, and then we do have a question. Can this Zoom presentation be archived so we can reference this at a later time? And yes, we will be putting this uh, recording of this on our YouTube channel. And you can also find it through our website. And what we will do is send out an email to everyone who was here this evening and let them know when the video is ready to be viewed. And um, we have a lot of other nice comments. Does anyone know if the compost at the Stonington landfill is good for soil in your garden? I don't know if it is or not. I would just be careful. I, I did get it one year and it did have uh, bits of glass in it. And so um, maybe the people to ask is the people there at the compost um, and just make sure that it's, uh, you know, you just don't know what's in that because it's being composted from all over. Uh, there is a, a place, the Resource Recovery in, in Rhode Island, um, they have a uh, great compost. So Resource Recovery, if you look them up, um, and I think they sell bags of it. And I have a question about soil testing. Um, how do you go about that? Do you test soil in different areas of the garden or is it yeah, kind you of generally? You take, uh, I think you dig down about four or five inches and you take out in whatever area you're in three soil samples and you mix that soil all together. And then you put a little bit of that soil into uh, a plastic bag. And if you're doing it for Yukon, you send it off uh, to Yukon. Um, there are soil testing kiosks uh, through URI at Wilcox Park um, almost every Saturday. And they will look at the content of your soil and also the pH level, but they won't, it doesn't test for um, soil amendments or you know any kind of chemicals that might be in your soil. So your best bet is to go to Yukon um, or UMass, um, but I, I have great luck with Yukon. For $12, it's totally worth it every three years. Great, thank you. And does anyone else want to unmute themselves and ask a question before we end for the evening? Hi, Noreen, Hi. it's Lindsay. Sorry. Hi, Lindsay. I just wanted to say, I cannot wait to see what comes up in our yard, knowing that your family once owned where we now live. Oh. <laughs> So sweet. <laughs> and thank you so much for this presentation. It was really, really helpful. Oh, you're welcome. Glad you could join. I, I also have a question. Sure. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much. That was really informative. Um, so we have just done a knotweed abatement in a large area of our uh, property. And we're on year three. So at what point would you suggest being able to sort of plant, we want to do a, a meadow or something. How long would you suggest after doing this abatement? Well, what did you take out? It was, it was all Japanese knotweed. Right. Yeah, Japanese knotweed is tough. Um, I actually was doing a kiosk for the University of Rhode Island a few years ago and the security officer came up and started talking to me and he had Japanese knotweed throughout his whole whole yard. And I said, well, what did you do? And he said, I just kept mowing it down, mowing it down. And he said, finally, after year four, I could plant. 
So, I mean, that's his yard in Rhode Island. Um, I would just kind of look, look at your yard. I mean, if you want to get all the Japanese knotweed out, you might want to wait one more year. Okay. Um, I definitely wouldn't use chemicals because um, then, you know, you've spoiled your soil. Um, my daughter did a meadow um, which was filled with invasives, not Japanese knotweed, but every other type of invasive. And she had the, the it harrowed, which is she hired someone from Rhode Island to come with his um, machine in the back that has all these chains on it and, um, and harrowed the field. And she still has some weeds in, but we just threw out all different kinds of uh, wildflower seed. And she had the most beautiful meadow in the, the very first season. She had cosmos that were like seven feet tall and coreopsis and milkweed and jack in the pulpit. And so, you know, if you wanna give it a try, it's just seed. And the other thing I wanted to say is a great source for um, wildflower seed is, um, this company called outsidepride.com, outsidepride, it's all one word, .com. And if you Google them, you'll see that they have Northeast wildflower seed mixes. They have bread seed, poppy seed mixes. And a lot of them, I find like for, you know, a, a half a pound, they're like $9. So it's not, you're not putting out a lot of money for the amount of seed that you'll get. So maybe you wanna be brave and just try it and see what happens. Yeah, I have nothing to lose. Thank you. That's nothing to lose. <laughs> Great, any last questions? We have a couple more minutes. Well, thank you so much, Noreen. You're welcome. Again, thank for you. this inspiring talk and I loved all of your images and videos. Very beautiful. Right. And thank you everyone for joining us and we'll let you know when the video is ready to be viewed.